Hey guys, don't forget to check out the Street Cop Training Conference 2023, April 23rd through the 28th, Nashville, Tennessee, the Gaylord at Opry. What a center, what a place. We have amazing speakers, amazing training, five of the most impactful days of your career. Check it out at streetcop.com. You do not want to miss out. There is a room code available for a discounted room. Sign up now at streetcop.com. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino. Today I have with me one of the old school, original class attendees. And you don't have to tell me when you came to the first class, but is now transforming to be an instructor for this company. Really, really cool program. Very, as a matter of fact, maybe I haven't revealed this to you before, but this has been my idea for a profound change in law enforcement and how we learn how to do things is exactly how this program is going to go. It's essentially video footage from body-worn cameras to help program your reticular activating system. But enough with that. Let's introduce Sergeant Craig Meyer. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. It's, uh, it's awesome to be here. I'm excited for all this. So, What was the motivation to make the course? Uh, it started years ago. Um, basically, uh, I went into academy with a thought of, of what I would be trained on. Uh, Went through it, kind of just got basic skills, that, but nothing about real police work, unfortunately. And that's not to say that every academy has those issues, but where I went through and from what I hear a lot of the academies as well, they're not teaching you on real police work and, you know, skills that'll help you when you get on the street. Uh, do a lot of baton work, some ground fighting stuff, some marching, then you get out on your own and uh, I felt totally unprepared. Um, I had to start, I guess, basically investing in myself and going and put myself through classes, uh, different things. I had an FTO, unfortunately, who didn't, uh, wasn't, you know, wasn't helping me at all as far as like learning the job and, and, and getting into police work that would, you know, help save me on the street. Even, even if it wasn't practical, I didn't learn anything that would help me survive out there and win an encounter. Uh, so I started investing in my own training. And, uh, I guess that's when I took my first street cop training class all the way back. I think it was 2013 was my first one. Wow. And it has wow. changed a lot. I think around when you, you first taught it, it was basically just out of the trunk of your car. We were in a small classroom. There was like five or 10 of us. And it was like a couple hour class. It was a whiteboard. And, um, that was when I, you know, that it all clicked for me there. And, uh, I went out shortly after that and had, uh, you know, a, you know, arrested a huge drug dealer off behavior. And uh, I was like, Oh wow, this works. You know, I was literally on my own about a week or two uh, off of, of uh, field training after taking that class. And, and that's when it clicked. And then they, the hits just kept coming. And uh, it, I was bit. And I just, anybody that would listen, I would start talking about this, you know, reading behavior and being proactive and, and doing real police work. And uh, it just, I don't know, I taught my brother, even while he was still in academy, he got out, started doing great things with it. And uh, we just, I don't know. I just knew my, my greater purpose was to pass this stuff on, pass the tools on, because there's just not enough, I guess, guys out there stepping up, taking the younger guys under the wing and teaching this. It's a gift, you know, and it really does change your career once you once you learn it. And uh, the fulfillment you get out of it is amazing. So let's unpack it's a gift for a little bit, because I don't think anybody was born with the skills to be a great cop. I think there might be some intrinsic variables of your DNA composition that may allow you to understand this quickly. But the cool thing about being better at anything is that you can learn how to be at better at anything. And the more you do those things, the more you practice those things, the better you get at them. So I don't know if anybody's, if anybody understand is born with a gift, but certainly skills can be developed. Would you agree with that? I fully agree. And um, for some, it takes them longer than others. And the road is not as straight to get there, but it, it can be done. Um, I, I know that for, for me, it was a hard road to get there and I had to learn through making mistakes and I own all those mistakes and accept humility in them. And, and you have to do that to have success and, and be good at this. It takes time to get this for some people. Others pick it up really quickly. I have certain guys I train and then wow, they're picking it up extremely quick and others it takes a little longer, but you got to get outside your comfort zone. If you know you're, have, if you have trouble talking to people, you need to invest yourself in you know, invest your time and getting better at speaking to people and public speaking and, and learning and you, you know, investing in yourself. That's so big here. And I think, you know, we're all about that. You're investing in, in, in our people and ourselves and uh, you can, you can really uh, develop yourself to be able to, you know, get this down, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't just, you're not just gifted with being good at this. You have to invest in yourself and, and it's definitely doable. Tell us about you, who you are, where you came from, where you are now. Tell us about you. Give me your history. Sure. Uh, so born and raised in New Jersey, grew up in a law enforcement family, 
I was really fortunate to have uh, awesome mentors in my family. Uh, my, my dad and my uncle were both in law enforcement. Uh, my dad Big was, shots too, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my dad was a game warden, but my uncle, who I was named after, he was uh, he ended up working on his way all the way up to be a chief, but he was super proactive. He was an interdiction guy. And even at, at, as small as an agency was, he was at, everywhere I would go in the state, no matter what, like everyone knew who he was and he was super respected. And uh, he wasn't a show and glow kind of guy, but he was doing so, crazy stuff out there. I mean, I, I'd be on the bus to school, like in elementary school, and I'd see all these cars parked off on the side of the road. And, uh, you know, I'd talk to other cops, and, you know, I'd see them, but, you know, your uncle, like, he cleaned the house last night. He put, you know, he was making all sorts of arrests and good quality arrests, though, not, you know, little stuff, but, like, he was, he was, he was ahead of the game in his time. And I had that mentorship all my life growing up. He was like a second dad to me, even as an uncle, he was like a second dad. And uh, he was my main mentor when it came to law enforcement. And so my brother, who was also big in interdiction and proactivity, he's doing great up there and he's still in New Jersey. Uh, we had that mentorship with him. And and uh, so we, you know, we took the torch and ran with it and uh, it's, it's been going great. So I started out in Jersey at an agency, paid my way through Academy, did an alternate route, got picked up by an agency, uh, Good, good size agency. I learned a ton there. Um, they had a, a hiring, uh, I guess not, not a hiring freeze, but a, I guess a freeze on contract. And so I was forced to go to a neighboring agency. Um, I left on good terms and it was not the person I loved where I was at in the beginning, but I had to do what I had to do. And so I was at my next agency, which is right next door for about four years there. I got a lot of good experience there. I had a couple of guys who were really proactive and took me under the way. I had a 17 year veteran. Um, I won't say his name on here, but he was a huge factor in me just, uh, being a hard charger out there. He, uh, he didn't care about what people had to say about proactive policing because it's not popular everywhere, unfortunately, uh, especially with admin. But uh, he didn't care. And he he taught me to not worry about what other people think. And he taught me uh, about behavior and being visible and watching reactions. And uh, I'm forever grateful for that. So about after five years on the job in Jersey, uh, my wife, who I met traveling back and forth hunting all over the country, she had moved up to Jersey with me from Texas. After about five years, she's like, you know what? Um let's try to do the family thing out in Texas. It's a great place, you know, with the dynamic, everything going on, you know, let's just do this for me. And I was very reluctant at first, but I applied to an agency down here uh, after hearing from some guys in this area about this agency and how much they support hard workers and hard chargers. And I came down here, applied, luckily got hired. And it was everything that I heard it was. They fully support all the practical work. It's all about hard workers, not about who you know. They love hard chargers. And I was able to come down here and they just let me fly. <laughs> and I went out there and had a blast. And things went really well. Ever since I've been here, things went well. Uh, I promoted to a sergeant position within three years. I took on an FTO coordinator position. Uh, I, I, I uh, tried out and made a sergeant's position on the SWAT team. Uh, things are great. You know, uh, we get to train a lot of officers here on proactive policing and uh, my admin all the way to the top fully support what I'm doing. They know what I'm doing and, and they love it and they want more of it. So uh, best decision I ever made coming down here. I'm, you know, in Texas now uh, and, and it's great. So things are good. The enthusiasm that comes across in your voice, I think, speaks volumes of how you see this profession. And interestingly enough, you'll find a lot of people with a lack of enthusiasm because they're beaten up. Yeah. And that leads me to my next question is you said that you were fearful to go from Jersey to Texas. Um, you know, there's not a roadmap in life that we get to follow, but we get to use a compass. And for me, the compass that I use is the fear. So you had fear. What if you would have listened to your amygdala, the lizard brain and let the anxiety say, now we're going to stay in Jersey. Yeah. How different would your life been now versus the enthusiasm that you live with and the, and the kind of lifestyle that you live today? Um, night and day. Um, I, I think every day about what if I had not come down here and we always fear the unknown, you know, uh, I was comfortable in my old agency, you know, I had a good gig. I was offered a lot of things to stay there. I was offered canine to go on loan with narcos, do all these things, you know, and uh big picture wasn't about that. It was about family and then going, knowing I had a productive, a proactive agency to go to down there was, was good. But I left my family, all these unknowns, all these comfortable things. You know, you get comfortable and you, you're afraid of the unknown. We especially, as no one's more afraid of change than cops, right? Um, so it was a huge step, but I'm forever grateful that I did it and that my wife was stubborn and pushed me to do it. Uh, but if I had stayed up there, uh, there's no way I would be able to, I guess, have the career fulfillment that I do now because there's just the dynamic up, up, up in the Northeast is a lot different. Um, I guess the, the push for active policing isn't as popular. Uh, uh, I guess we don't get to uh, police the same way that we do down here. And so for what I'm into and in teaching and, and promoting proactivity and developing others and fulfilling my greater purpose, this is where I need to be up there. It, it would have been hindered for sure. There's no way I would have been able to do what I'm doing now. So um, I think that that's 
and I'll just give some clarification there. There are plenty of people in the Northeast who are doing a lot of great work. Yeah. I think that there are actually places in Texas where you're at that will actually hinder your ability to work as well. So I've been there enough yeah. to know that like the guys in the Houston area and that Harris County, they are state, they, they Houston PD is like, dude, it's like a never ending battle here because they don't want to prosecute oh, anybody. Sure. Just let people yeah. out. So I think that's more of a cultural thing to the, to the location of where they're at. So I think you found a really good spot yeah, I did. there in yeah. Texas that's supporting proactive police work. Yeah, for sure. I want to go back for a second. You talked about hunting. Tell us about your hunting career. Okay. So, um, I guess that's where it kind of started with getting comfortable in front of the camera and talking to people and things of that nature. So uh, about 15 years ago, um, before hunting on television and filming hunts and all this stuff got big, uh, me and a few other of my, my best friends in college, we got together and we're like, you know, let's do this. You know, we're entertaining. We like to hunt. Let's film our hunts. So we all, we literally like took out personal loans and like saved our money together. We bought high-end camera equipment, editing software, and we started filming our own hunts. And that was when it was still like VHS, like DVDs were just starting to do anything. It was standard definition, if believe it or not, standard definition of handy cams. We started filming our stuff and producing hunts and we're selling them out of the trunk of our cars. And um, after a few years of doing that, um, we met the right people, you know, it's all about, you know, uh, connections and we met right pe the right people. They liked our personalities and we started getting cherry picked for professional platforms on the outdoor channel and the sportsman's channel, uh, you know, Fox sports, those major, and we all got cherry picked and we hunted professionally on different shows. We we're traveling all over the country. We had tons of sponsors. Uh, we got to, you know, go to the best places. We, we learned a lot of, you know, the tricks of the trade and being in front of the camera and, and marketing and, uh, it was a great experience. And I, and I did that for some really large companies for about 10 to 15 years. And uh, it took me all over the place. I met my friends I'd never meet. And that's actually how I actually got down to Texas. Uh, I was filming and producing a hunt in South Texas for a TV show. And through mutual friends, I met my wife. And we started and we met up in Austin and we started doing the long distance thing, flying back and forth. So had it up been for the hunting, I never would have ended up in Texas because that's really where it my roots go back to is this hunting here and, and traveling. So it was one good hunting story. The elk and the bear. Those are the two hunts that always stick out. My biggest bull elk and then uh, my largest black bear. Uh, real quick, I, I, the elk was probably the most rewarding. I uh, I went into public land in Colorado and I spent two weeks there on foot public land with my with archery. And I uh, got there with a like uh, my, my cameraman at the time, and unfortunately um, he showed up out of shape and not prepared for the hunt. It was a true and brutal. We we're like eleven to thirteen thousand feet most of the week. And he uh, made up an excuse that I think like, his his father-in-law got abducted and he was in the Navy and all this stuff. And he just kind of just ghosted me and left me in the middle of the week with no cameraman. So I ended up meeting some like skater dude at like, like basically the parking area, one of these public man spots. And he agrees to film me having never filmed with the camera before. And we spent like the next week and a half up in the high country in the mountains hiking. I hiked like 90 something miles with a 50 pound pack on a super dehydrated. It's brutal. Like I was questioning everything. And then on the very last day, I ended up having a uh, monster bull elk come down the hill and uh, we called him in and I ended up making a 97 yard shot with archery, perfect shot, double lung on film, on video, and up here in the bull go down. And we spent the next like 10 hours packing them out with horses and mules that we satellite phoned in. And uh, we got down to the bottom of the mountain and ate a piece of uh, back strap off and uh, cooked it up and everything is on film documented. And is that moment that I feel like it was an apex moment for me in my hunting career. Cause uh, one, the shot was insane. I, I don't know if I'd ever be able to make it again. I had practiced that to hundred yards for months, but uh, it was, it was awesome. I, you know, I'll be able to share that hunt with anybody who wants to watch it. It's pretty epic. And we packed the bull out and uh, it was that, you know, that backcountry, uh, you know, horseback adventure that, you know, you chase as a hunter all your life. And we were able to kind of make it, make it work after about two weeks in the high country. So that was uh, probably one of the most special moments for hunting for me. And that I shoulder mounted the bulls on my wall. I look at it every day when I step out in the living room. So that's awesome, dude. Yeah. Can these find you anywhere and watch your hunts? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Especially that hunt in particular it went pretty viral at the time it's been on a few different shows but i'll be happy to share the link uh which once this podcast here people can watch it so uh, it was can they cool watch it on moment. youtube yeah yeah for sure yeah, it's on there what should you search on youtube to find that that video uh, i think it's a uh, craig meyer hunting or you know 97 yard elk shot something like that i think i forget what's on there so um uh, i've guessed it on a bunch of different tv platforms but i have like my own stuff that i play around with youtube and social media and instagram and all that so it's awesome, dude. Yeah, it's it's good. It's taken me a lot of places that I'd never be able to afford if I did. I just have a camera running over my shoulder. So, so tell me about mm -hmm. what this training program you authored is. Sure. Um, so, I'm huge on uh, making mental reps with video we watch and 
most I like good footage. I like when officers are doing good jobs. You know, we watch stuff that's bad and we break it down, but I really like when officers are doing good things because I believe through that those mental repetitions, officers can make those their own memories. And when we watch video and break it down, we can form contingencies in our head of what we would do in that instant for when we do encounter that situation and we can feel prepared for it. I know, uh, especially with this class, right? Not every agency, not every officer is going to get to experience all these events and high risk stuff and behavior changes and whatnot, get into a brawl. And it might happen once in their career, if, if, if it ever, you know, if not at all. But when we watch this footage that I'm going to you know, go over with all these officers and break down these experiences, it's going to become their own mental rep in their head. So we're going to keep, you know, having repetition on that. And these officers, when they encounter something similar on the street or they see that behavior change, they see this happening, they're going to also, it's going to trigger something in their brain, right? That activation, and then they're going to know how to handle it, right? It's going to become like, they're going to base, basically experience this stuff when we're watching it in the class and going over all these different things. And it's in their head, okay, wow, I know when he does this, this is something I need to be very, you know, cautious about, okay? This is how he's behaving in reaction to me. I need to be aware of this to keep me alive. Instead of, oh, I'm, I'm not, if you're not seeing tells, if you're not knowing what's going on or how to how to work through it and win the encounter or get another unit there, um, you could get injured or killed or, you know, or lose. So mm. that's, that's what I'm big on. I'm big on going over stuff like with my guys at Ship Reef every day. Ship Reef every day is a, uh, I guess, uh, a training moment. We, uh, we break down footage and we go through it. And then I actually, I do decision-making exercises every day where I give them a scenario and I let them work through it amongst themselves. And then we watch a video, how someone else handled that good, bad, or indifferent. We want, I want them to like start problem solving in their head on their own and thinking on their feet. And then we watch video to make it so that they get another mental rep of that and they have it in their bank for contingencies, you know, look how, if this X happens, you know, I'm going to do Z, you know, so forth. So that's, that's what I'm big on. And that's what this class is all about winning encounters and staying alive, doing it. What do you think there are top three qualities that make a great cop for somebody who's enthusiastic? There might be one of them. You, you can, you can use that if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, enthusiasm and a- attitude, right? Attitude is huge. You need to be positive. Okay. Um, it's contagious. Uh, you need to go into this job every day with a positive outlook, be enthusiastic, be personable, um, presentable, you know, just, you need to come into this with a positive attitude an open mind. Um, that, that's what it's all about. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're talking to people every day and this doesn't work if you come off like a jerk, you know, you need to be a, a nice person. And, you know, obviously there's times to step up and, and turn, you know, flip the switch and, and be hard, but, uh, this thing doesn't work if you're not a good person to pe- and you treat people with respect, right? So, and, and having enthusiasm doing that is huge. That's one of those things. Uh, I think uh, another trait uh, would be not thinking you know it all. You need to be opening to learning every day. Um, you're always going to meet people with certain skills and talents. And um, if you're not listening and open to learning from those people and, and ex- experiencing their talent, uh, you can't make it your own and, and you need to be multidimensional and strengthen who you are and consistently consistently be opening to uh, open to developing yourself. Uh, and if, if you have a closed mind and think you know it all, there's only one way to uh, you know solve a problem or skin a cat, you're not going to grow. And uh, you have to have an open mind and, and we're constantly growing. Like you, this job, you never, you never hit your apex, uh, I guess, uh, ability. You never, uh, I guess, hit you never experience your full potential if you have a closed mind and you're not willing to, you know, keep uh, learning and changing as, as things change. So, and then probably the third of uh, uh, common sense, uh, you know, unfortunately it's not so common anymore. So we have these classes to try and really like teach people up. Right. Um, some people have more common sense than others. Um, there's, you know, I seen officers out of Academy and maybe one officer will pick up on something really quickly and, uh, they can read behavior or they, they see something that's not safe or whatever, and they're better off for it, you know, having common sense and life experience. That's huge. Some people don't have that. Um, you know, unfortunately, I just sound like it is. I, I went to college, but going to college isn't everything. And unfortunately, people think going to college and uh, I guess getting an education means and having a bachelor's means when you get on the street that you have common sense and you've had job, life experience, which is not always the case. We have a lot of our best guys who come into this more so with life experience and uh, job experience and they're better off because they've developed common sense from that. So I think those are probably the three things that uh, I, I would harp on are uh, the enthusiasm and having a good attitude, having common sense, and uh, I guess being open to uh, to other outside training and, and experiencing and absorbing other people's strengths and making them your own, uh, having an open mind, not thinking you know it all. So 
What do you think or what do you hope that people will get out of your training course? One of the main things I think they're going to get out of this course is confidence. Um, if we can't, if we don't have confidence and, and know what we're looking for, which I'm going to teach, I'm going to dive right into what we're looking for so they can pick up on things. Uh, if, and then they're going to get confidence from it. They're going to be confident in going after that, you know, that subject and trying to get a stop on them. And when they're confident, you know, they can be smooth and do their job. I, not to go off on a tangent, but I always preach, be confident, solid in your detention. When we're not solid on our detention, we get hurt. Guys go half speed. They're able to be intimidated by that person they're stopping because they're half in, half out if they have a good stop or not, or they understand or can speak to and articulate their suspicion, right? When we're solid in our detention, solid in what our reasonable suspicion is, we can work smoothly through the stop. We're unwavering. We're not intimidated out of the stop, and we can work it and slow the game down. But when we're half speed or we don't know what we're looking for, or rattled, and we can't articulate what we're seeing, that's when we get in trouble and we get hurt and bad people get away. What kind of cop are you and what kind of proactivity do you, do you enjoy doing? Uh, so for me, um, what everyone always, when they sign up for this job, they're like, Oh, I want to help people. Right. I too signed up for this job for this job to help people. The way I help people is going out and arresting criminals and taking really bad people off the streets. So they can't victimize others. Um, and I guess, Make people feel people feel safe because there's not as many criminals on the street. Um, I attack the criminal element every single day. I take pride in that. Um, no one has more fun out there than me um, on patrol. I, I mean, it's no exaggeration. You ask guys at work, but I would get my marked unit out there. I'd have the doors open, make sure everything was sharp, clean, presentable. I was ready to rock and roll. Everything was in, you know, uh, up to standard for me. I'd have the, uh, the maybe this because of sports growing up, but I literally had the national anthem playing every morning on the PA. Uh, just get ready to go out there. It's, you know, starting every game, you know, sports, but Star Spangled Banner, get ready to party out there, get my music going, get hyped, get everybody up. Morale is everything, right? So it's contagious. When you go out there and you get ready to go, like, let's go. You know, you look at your guys around you, it was contagious. I had all these guys ready to go out there and just hammer and have fun on the street every day. Um, I took pride in going out there and being proactive and being a uh, team leader uh, on on patrol. And then when I promoted, uh, that didn't change. I just literally refocused my energy into my people at developing them. And I go out and ride with my guys as much as I can. I'm huge at being a road sergeant. I I'm not a fan of sergeants that just sit at the desk and kind of don't do a lot. Um, any free moment I have after my paperwork and everything I need to do is done. I get on the road. Uh, I hop in the, I hop in the seat with my officers. I train them and teach them. I lead from the front. Um, they, they love it. And I hear that all the time that when I'm on the street making proactive arrests, like solid arrests, I'm still getting into arrests all the time. Uh, just, just had one two days ago, real good one. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but when they hear storage going traffic, stopping cars, it's contagious. I hear the radio just boom, ding, everything starts going off and people want to get into it. And I hear from other people that aren't on my team that, uh, you know, they wish they could be over here and not to sound like it is, but. They love when sergeants and higher ups are proactive and, and start, you know, leading the charge and, and you know, going to battle with them every day. And that's something I swore when I promoted that I would still maintain, and I have, and, and I love it. And my people are really enjoy it, and and I'm allowed, I'm I'm developing them literally in the next seat next to me, and it's a great thing to watch them grow as new officers. So, it's amazing. What was the uh, was the job two days ago? Uh, I was on my. <laughs> I looked at one of my officers and I said, "Hey, you know, let's go out and get into something. My paperwork's done." So they said, let's go. I went and fueled up the car. I'm on my way back from the uh, municipal service complex. And I see a guy, and we talked about this in my class with behavior changes. I see a guy going down the street. I don't think too much of him. But when he sees me, he immediately, did what I call it like maternal, shoulders come up, chin tucks. He immediately gets on his phone and lights up a cigarette. I'm like, well, that's my guy. And I had a walking violation on him. So I see him. As I get closer, he continues to panic. <clears throat> I swing around on him. I make it look like I'm not coming after him because I don't want him to bolt. He had to jump on me going the wrong way. So I, I turned around, I, I made the block, and I came around behind him, and he had already switched sides of the street and then switched back in. He's really nervous, trying to maintain visual on me. I ended up going to traffic stop on him. Played it cool because he was super nervous. He, see, he looks back, sees me. I hop out. I play it cool. This is what I preach to is downplay everything. Come off as the nicest cop. you got to buy yourself time, right? We don't want them to know that we're suspicious, that we know that what's up. They need to think that we're just a nice cop and they're going to be on their way and we need to downplay everything, calm them down, because when they first we first jump out, they're doing the freeze, fight, or flight, okay? And we need to work through that until we get in a position to win the encounter, right? Get in a position where we have another unit there. I'm big on these things. I literally, I talk in my class how we're going to talk to people, how we're going to lower their guard. 
I get out, come up, I'm like, hey, Sergeant Meyer, Brian Pete, everything's cool, man. Just a just a traffic stop for the walking violation. Doesn't necessarily mean I plan on writing you a ticket for, but everything's cool, man. Do you ever name, you know, do you have, you know, do you have an idea on you? Oh, you don't? Okay, of course he didn't have an idea on him. Yeah, he did, but he started patting doing the pat, looking around. I'm like, oh boy. As I'm working on him, he starts bleeding. He keeps bleeding. I call it the sundial. Like as the sun moves, the, the sundial will move. For me, as I'm trying to square up with him, he keeps blading, 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 because he's holding in his right pocket. And it's just something I see a lot with people who are holding either contraband or a gun, the side that it's on, they'll keep blading away from us. It's also their feet are pointing where they want to go. They want to be out of this encounter. So I'm downplaying things. As soon as he gets on the phone, panicking, after I've already told him he's not getting a ticket, I'm like, all right, give me another two units over here. And uh, I said it in code, we use 10 code here, which because and we ear pieces were huge on tactics. We don't want them to panic because these criminals on the street that have been to the game, as you start talking in plain language, a lot of times they will immediately evade and uh, they know what's up. So we try to really downplay things until we get another unit there, get in positions to win the encounter. Uh, so I, uh, I bought some time and, and as my other unit shows up, he goes to get ready to run and we go hands on, we grab him, we hook him up. He had felony uh, part of parole hits for, evade, uh, uh, for evading in a vehicle. He had an outstanding warrant, not even yet to have been apprehended yet for assault on a public servant. Uh, he ended up having some drugs on him, but uh, the big key on this one was search incident to arrest. I get a stolen check out of his pocket. It had not been reported yet. He had just committed over 20 car burglary, uh, sorry, uh, mail theft burglaries at mailboxes at an apartment complex a few miles away. We made phone calls and we were able to on site and add all those charges uh, and work that investigation that had not even yet been reported. We called back to possible victims, potential victims, and they confirmed, yeah, our mailbox has been broken into and we were able to link up to all these burglaries and all this activity going on uh, right then and there as a result of that proactive stop. We got checks back to people, we got mail, we worked it, it ended up being a huge investigation off of this just behavior. So it was great. It worked out really well. Wow, it's important, so, man. You certainly yeah. are helping people, bro. Yeah. It's real good shit. Dude, I'm pumped about the class. Me too. I'm excited. It's gonna it's gonna help a lot of people. Um, I've been working on it for a couple of years now, just slowly, just getting where it needed to be. I don't want to rush this thing. I wanted it to get where it needed to be. I'm working on this lesson plan, working on the videos, putting everything where it needs to be to help people. You know, I wish I had this class early on. I wouldn't have had to go through the struggles and different things that I had to do on my own. Um, so that's what it's all about. Because it's it's about the students taking this class. It's gonna change careers. Um, it's also gonna help us just keep us safe, you know, things I talk about in this class, I talk about tactics as well and how we're working stuff, how we're positioning other our backup units, when we're getting people out, working the door jams, all these different things, how we're, what kind of words we're using to I guess keep people calm and work the cars and, and different tactics. And when I would talk a lot, it, it spans a lot of different things. Um, it's going to help guys a lot in all aspects. If nothing else, it'll save a lot of people's lives with how we're going to change the tactics on this class too, aside from looking for the behavior changes. So, yep. Listen, man, a lot of the stuff you talked about seems to be like unorthodox, uncomfortable police work, but yeah. look how effective it is. And that's what we preach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You got to be, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, true criminals. They prey on the fact that a lot of cops are afraid to pry and ask questions. Um, you need to be curious as a cop and you need to, you know, you can trust people, but you need to validate, right? You need to ask certain questions that might be uncomfortable. Um, they, so like one topic I talk about is disclaimers and not just physical disclaimers, but uh, uh, let's say like employment disclaimers or location disclaimers. Uh, like the other night we were talking about, uh, the other night we were talking about uh, the, the bouquet, right? We had uh, we made a stop on a guy, slow rolled a stop at felony warrants, and he was a drug dealer and he had a bunch of narcotics in the vehicle. Literally, my officer, who we've taught, I've taught this to, is standing there talking to the guy, and the guy tries to throw up a disclaimer of location. Oh, it's one o'clock in the morning. He's like, I'm just coming from the cemetery. He literally shoves a bouquet in his face. Like, look, like, look, I'm a good guy. Like, I'm coming from the cemetery. There's no way I'm doing anything wrong. Like, oh, I'm celebrating a dead family member, blah, blah, blah. Thinking, oh, there's no way this guy, you know, he wants, the, he wants the cop to get the idea. There's no way I'm doing anything wrong. And it's a disclaimer, right? It, you know, just there's many form of disclaimers. And those are disclaimers to think there's no way I'm engaged in criminal activity. And we talk a lot about that in this class as well. So it's going awesome, to be good. Yeah, I'm excited for it. So Listen, this is a great first time we've done this podcast. I'm sure we'll do it again. And yeah. everybody should look for Craig's upcoming class once he rolls out his first program, which will be in the next week or so. Yeah. Uh, then we will actually be scheduling at treecop.com. So this is one that I've already told the staff here. This is going to be a good one. This one's going to be a this one's going to be a hit. Yeah, it's going to be a effective policing tactics and skills. So we're, we're excited for it. It's really good. It's going to cover a lot of stuff. It's going to be a deep dive in. It's going to be a very uh, very fun as a student because it's just 
it's nonstop. And uh, it, it's going to be, it's going to be a good class. So we're excited for it. Well, I appreciate you choosing me, dude. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's where, it's where it all began back to my roots. So. Yeah. All right, dude. Well, listen, uh, been a great podcast episode and I'm going to let yeah. you go because I see people talking to you behind oh, the scenes. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the guys who watched the podcast. So I'm sure that's why I got the middle finger when he was in the windows. <laughs> oh, does he want to come in and say hello? Oh, he just, he just had to go to a call. We, uh, we had a, we, I think we have a, uh, we had a foot pursuit going on right now with a bunch of people who are stealing catalytic, conver- catalytic converters and bailed on foot everywhere in the city. So that they're going to have to get a perimeter going right now. So. All right, man. Well, listen, I don't want to hold yeah. you up. Yeah, we'll make it activated. Yeah, so we'll see. All right, dude. I will see you. Thanks. Have a good one. See you.